entering the webinar so it's uh, good to uh, good to hear you. well I can, we can't see you but we know you're there so thanks for being here guys so sport and empathy and how understanding and how reflections on that uh, make us better humans really this is a great webinar to be involved with and uh, I'm pleased to be joined by a wonderful panel of Alison uh, Leeper and Darcy so um yeah, it's great. It's great to be here. And um, I'm uh, I'm absolutely thrilled that um, um, Ed has invited me to be along for this. Uh, I think it's a fantastic week. And this week is just, you know, something we need more of these types of weeks, you know, these types of reflection weeks, these times of, you know, solution based weeks. They're all they're all really, really vital for for life and for understanding of how we can get on and be better as, as people uh, and in workplaces and as human beings. So I'm just going to say a little bit about myself very quickly um, and then I'll introduce the panel. We'll get the panel to introduce, introduce themselves. And then uh, we'll go from there. So, um, and also do feel free as well towards the end of the session to send in your questions for anybody uh, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, so yeah, looking forward to, to this one. Uh, so yeah, I'm Gavin, Gavin Ramshaw. Nice to meet you all. I'm a presenter for BBC Sport. I do BBC News as well. Uh, I've done loads of stuff over the years, probably 15, 16 years now uh, on TV, which feels like it's aged me a lot. Um, but at the same time, do still feel relatively fresh. Um, having in Sky and CBS for, for a long time, CBS American News, um, and then um, helped start up a couple of channels as well. Um, so yeah, lots of sport involved in my my daily life, really. I'm ex, I'm an ex sort of like semi-pro footballer, but I do mainly BBC Sport now, uh, and I do, uh, I've done sport over the years, really. So um, this panel has been, a, is, is a great one to reflect on for how empathy is involved with that and how, you know, particularly women's sport is, is in the mix with that too. Um, we've got some great panellists for that. So I'll kick off first with uh, my uh, the person on my left of my screen here, Alison, and then we'll go to Lipper and Darcy. So uh, we'll go sort of anti-clockwise round. So if you want to go first, Alison, I don't know if anyone can see it, whether it's the same directions as me, but yeah, Alison, if you go first and then we'll uh, I'll introduce the others. Thank you, Gavin. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, fantastic, as Gavin said, to be part of this morning's session. I'm a huge um, fan of Empathy Week and really privileged to be uh, sitting here alongside Lipper, Darcy and, and Gavin. I'm a chief executive of a children's charity called the Youth Sport Trust and we have a simple mission uh, which is to build brighter futures through the power of P in sport and we work in partnership with schools to do that um, and absolutely as the title of this session uh, indicates really we believe that sport is an amazing environment if we can get it right for every young person, if we can make sure it's inclusive, it's meaningful, it's relevant, it's enjoyable if we can find that um, solution for every young people to fall in love with moving and playing, that environment of being involved in sport can be the ultimate tool for building empathy. And I've seen that before I was at the Youth Sport Trust. I was a teacher of PE, uh, then went into teacher training and, and now almost every day, perhaps more so than ever post the pandemic um, and all of the life experiences that we've been through. We need environments which nurture a sense of belonging. Uh, give us a place in the world and help us connect on a human level with other people because whatever anybody tells you um, we as human beings are designed to operate in societies and in community and in this day and age um, there are there are a few times actually when that happens because of the wonder of digital technology we're often as we are probably this morning all in different places and we need to have opportunities to come together and sport play physical activity is brilliant for that and then my final point Gavin if I may is just on this theme of women uh, next week is International Women's Day we've got a panel here of some wonderful women uh, to talk about empathy and the importance of sport in that we know that there are persistent participation gaps between girls and boys between men and, and women um, and while there's amazing groundbreaking work going on um, women particularly according to the research, enjoy taking part in sport when it allows them to be with their friends, um, to be with the people that they enjoy the company of. And that's why with Sport England's This Girl Can campaign just relaunched yesterday, all about closing the enjoyment gap. So that's a particular thing for me. I hope that's hope that's a good enough start. Thanks, Gavin. Pleasure. No, no, great, great words. So yeah, the This Girl Can thing, we were doing that a lot yesterday. Um... Yeah, interesting research there. We'll touch on that, I'm sure, uh, in the chat. Uh, Lippa, do you want to go next? As you are so nicely, I might as well. Morning, <laughs> everyone. Actually, it could be evening or nighttime for you. So hello from wherever you are. 
Um, my name is Lippa. Um, I'm a former semi professional footballer and now a sports activist. And I sit on several sports boards and advisory boards, but they're a bit too formal for me. So I won't really touch upon that today. Um, so the way I started my sporting journey is through rebellion, I'd like to say. My dad didn't really want me to play football. So what did I do? I went to play football. And the first football he brought was a character football. And from that stemmed my curiosity for sports. And since that day, I've just been in sports, around sports, eat, breathe, and get basically everything to do with sports. Um, and my sort of aim is to provide minorities with voices um, in places where our voices are not heard, whether that be on board level, within sports policy, or even in um, spaces that prior to us being here, our ancestors weren't welcome in. So making sure our voices are heard in every capacity and also making sure that the younger me would have loved the environment I am creating. So yeah, that's me, sweet and short. Nice. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good form. Thanks, Lippa. Um, so yeah, Darcy, last but definitely not least, of course. Um, great to meet you. And um, yeah, look forward to hearing more from you today. So yeah, do you want to just say a little bit about yourself and how your sort of like journey of empathy and like what you're up to is sort of like, you know, involved in your sphere at the moment? Thanks, Gavin. Um, good morning or hello to everyone. I'm Darcy Vaughan. I'm a professional hockey player for GB in England. And I think, like similar to Alison said, I believe sport is a really wonderful thing for everyone involved. And a lot of the work I do now is to make my sport in particular, but sport in general, more inclusive so everyone can get the opportunities that sport has brought me. And I regularly think about how sport has really brought me together with the most random but incredible mix of people from all over the world, from all different communities, genders, sexualities, races, religions, because you all have that shared goal of being at your best together. You have to get past any differences. And that's one thing I really love about sport. And although today is about empathy in sport and specifically women's equality in sport, my journey started with a slightly different viewpoint. And like many others, I found my voice in 2020. I was attending a Black Lives Matter protest and a photo of me holding the sign asking why is ending race in a debate was taken and shared virally. And it was shared by athletes like David Beckham and Lewis Hamilton, but it was also shared by Martin Luther King III. And that for me was the moment when I realised I'd been given the opportunity to use my platform. And shortly after I started university in the States, which was obviously an interesting time to move there, and I promised myself that I would take that key value with me and I asked my coach out there if we could wear Black Lives Matter shirts in the warm-ups because a lot of other teams were doing it and she said that I was okay and asked me to send an anonymous survey to my team to make sure everyone was okay with it. We had 20 girls in our team I immediately got back 19 responses all saying yes. By the end of the day I had 22 responses three of which were no which meant someone had triple voted no. So as a team we got together to speak about our feelings and thoughts and one girl immediately broke into tears and she admitted that for her, she thought she'd be letting her family down. She came from a traditionally Republican family, her parents were cops, and she thought by wearing the shirt, she'd be betraying them. And because she was my teammate and someone I previously was hoping to be a friend, I thought we needed to move forward. And in order to do this, I tried to understand where she was coming from. And I said to her, look, I kind of get what you're saying but I'm not asking you to wear a shirt that says defund the police. I'm not asking you to wear a shirt that says we hate Trump. I'm asking you to wear a shirt with the three words, black lives matter. And if you're not okay with me doing that or my teammates doing that, then you don't value my life. And that was all it took for her to empathize with me. And weeks later, she was wearing the shirt. She was holding my hand while I was taking a knee in the national anthem. At the end of the year, she was probably the most outspoken on all things EDNI, not just Black Lives Matter. And now she's left university, she works in EDNI. And I think, although I've had the inspiring interactions with people off the back of that photo and professional athletes, it's stories like this and moments like this that really empower me and prove that empathy is such a key route to, positive, to positively influence those around us. And now I'm back in the UK and doing more work on all things EDNI. I think this is generally a tool that I try to use to help and positively impact those around us. So I guess that's just. Yeah. Wow. 
That's really powerful. Thank you, Darcy, very much for that. Yeah, that's, that is an amazing story. And also credit to you for all the work you've been doing. Um, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah. So first of all, thank you for all those uh, those points, guys. I just wanted to um, sort of start off, really. I mean, Lippa touched on it just there around the idea of stereotyping and um, and what that sort of how that impacts you in your your sort of like lines of work effectively or your lines of business. Um, you know, I'm sure people listening now will have been the victim of stereotyping and will have been, um, you know, will have seen it, will have, will have been, you know, are, 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 you know, it's, it's all around us, isn't it? It's all around us every day without, without fail. Um, so how does the impact, how does the impact of stereotyping really affect you, how you go about your, your kind of like line of duty, if you like, um, let's start with, um, let's go back the other way now. So let's go Darcy first, if that's all right. Yeah, I think. That's a really good question and within I think there's two things within my sport specifically one being women's sport in general I think are generally just viewed very differently and we're on a huge mission at the moment to try and make the space of women's sport as big and as fun and as important as men's sport and you see that when you go into like coach and give talks at schools how interactive the boys are and just trying to show the girls that this is a space for them too because when I started sport, I had to be a part of the boys' teams because there weren't always girls' teams. And then also, I think, as a minority in my sport, hockey is a very predominantly white sport. I think in the men's and women's senior teams, there's three people of colour out of 75 of us. And it's, again, showing people that this can be a space for them, even if there aren't many people that look like them yet. Um, breaking down those barriers and just using what you have that... The differences can be what makes you better than everyone. Yeah, yeah. Lippa, you were talking about it. You're the one who raised this this sort of issue in a way. Um, what what would you say around your journey? You know how stereotyping has has affected empathy for you. Um. So I've always been like I've always been labelled. So when I was I was born in '98. So a couple of years later, 9/11 happened and 7/7. So all my childhood, I was always seen as the bad guy or not me necessarily, but the colour of my skin yeah, and people what sort of wears and what I wear. And associate you so, with what, yeah, with, with a, an yeah. event which is like completely nothing to do with you, but then it's just, you know, yeah. oh, this person looks like w- yeah. what we're seeing on the media that's being portrayed as, as you know, evil. So, yeah, I get you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So my mum used to pick me up. She used to wear a headscarf and a and long dress. So after 7-7, my friends, real- friends realised that I was a bit different. Um, that was fine because they were all kids but it was like the teachers who treated me a little bit differently so when it was playtime they would be like oh no we'll we'll hold on to the ball football because you don't have to play football uh, when actually it was at my skin and the the things that they were aware of outside of school which impacted the quality of pay- play I was having in school and yeah so since then <laughs> I, I feel as though I've become more resistant to the little the little noises here and there and it's allowed me to become this sports activist because I wanted to be that person I never had growing up fighting this fight I don't know how long it's going to be probably the rest of my life hence the activist at the end of sports and the beauty of sport is it's a it's an international tongue everyone can speak it everyone can play it and it doesn't matter who you are where you're from what your religious you know identity is is a sport for everyone, it's for all. And when I was playing semi-pro, unfortunately, uh, Islamophobia was rife then um, due to the um, impact of media and the stereotypes. So after that, I sort of gave up my semi-professional career and decided to become an influencer within the scene. So went to um, uni, studied sports business and educate, um, sports business and coaching. And from there, started to grow. And I had the support of white men. You wouldn't believe it, but white men got me to the position I'm I'm in because my own community would not help me because it was looked down upon. A woman shouldn't do that. So I was fighting a fight within my community and outside of my community. So hopefully the next generation won't need to do that anymore. Yeah, wow, yeah, that's yeah, that's incredible. Fair play to you. Uh, and Alison, yeah, you mentioned about the the this girl can campaign. I mean, that's been a, a big Sport England and National Lottery funded um, study, uh, which showed that you know two and a half million, is it two and a half million fewer women felt 
like they were less able to do sport or less able to enjoy sport uh, than mm -hmm. men. And, you know, that that just kind of from a stereotype point of view, that just feels like it's, you know, going backwards, you know, from considering what we've had over the last few years, particularly like, you know, the women's the women's European championships with the Lionesses winning it uh, and, the, you know, the, the women's Super League, just football as an example. Um, there are so many examples of great top level women's sport where you look at that, you think that would be a great example for for young girls to get into. But it seems like the research isn't quite reflecting that. How, do you think there's a bigger journey ahead for all, all that stuff? And, you know, is stereotyping a, a problem for what th that research may have found? So it's a really, again, really great question, Gavin, because I think what's happening is I think at the top end of sport, elite sport, we're seeing, uh, we're nowhere near there yet, but we are seeing some progress. We are seeing, for example, more media coverage of elite women's sport, whether that be Olympic, Paralympic, um, you know, uh, Premier League uh, football, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's getting there. Um, and I think that can sometimes present a false representation of what's happening more broadly. And the This Girl Can campaign is really trying to highlight the fact that um, for, for too many women, sport just isn't seen as something for them. And, and what they don't identify with is a load of role models who are like them. It's very similar to, to what Lippa was actually saying there about, you know, her particular background, just gender itself. Women in sport tend to be represented as very fit, very athletic, very competitive, because that's what we see, because that's what's in the shop window. And we, the This Girl Can campaign is full of role models and, and uh, individual human interest stories about women who are just like many of us. You know, there are a diversity of role models within that campaign, which kind of says to women, sport is for you, whoever you are, whatever you look like, whatever interests you, there is a sport for you and there's a, a welcoming environment for you. So I think there is a distortion and, and, you know, it's inevitable that the media is not going to be covering grassroots sport every day. Uh, you know, the, 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 the spectators of sport, the fans of sport want to follow those top teams. But but that is what, you know, we see. And and right going right back down to um, early childhood, what we see in the playground is we see gender identity starting to manifest itself at a very early age and children sort of encouraged according to their gender, socialized according to their gender. Um, and that's one of the things we're really working hard to break down. You mentioned uh, the lionesses there. We're working with FA and Barclays to provide equal access to girls to football. Um, but alongside that, the term equal access implies we want equal access to any sport for boys or girls. Um, you know, sports should be a level playing field. It shouldn't be there are certain sports that girls can play and certain sports they can't and vice versa. So I think sport just provides, again, um, this, this levelling environment. Lippert called it the universal tongue, but it's also a levelling environment if those who are providing it can be very, very aware of what they offer. PE teachers, the people that I work with day in, day out, what they offer either reinforces a gender stereotype or can completely smash it to pieces and empower young people, whatever their gender identity, uh, to be themselves and feel a sense of belonging in sport. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's absolutely bang on. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, um, Darcy, I wanted to ask you a little bit about you know your experiences when you um, when you talked about in your intro about how uh, you know you were sort of perceived with um, taking the stand and being very very vocal about BLM. Um, I know it was a couple of years ago now, isn't it? So how do you think that has the conversation has changed from the time that you did what you did to where we are at now? Because, the, you know, I still see when I go do the games for BBC Sport that, it's, you know, some teams take the knee, not all. Um, some fans applaud it, some don't. Um, you know, the England team still do it. Um, but it, it's it's kind of like, it's still there, but it's not necessarily as in the conversation as much. Workplaces don't have as much chat about it. Uh, I remember when it when the George Floyd incident happened, uh, the murder happened. Sorry, um, that uh, you know it was front and center everywhere. Everybody was talking about it. Workplaces were having to address racial inequality. I'm um, sort of going off the women's sort of aspect of empathy now, but I'm just more on the the lines of race and understanding with perception. So from your um, your sort of like journey from what you did, which went viral, and you know your your activist work within your, the university days, and to where you are now with a, being a professional athlete, how do you think you've seen the journey change? Um, yeah, I think 
all the points you made there are spot on. And the the murder of George Floyd isn't something new, you know. Some everyone saw it, but that's the only difference. I think because we were in COVID and didn't really have much else to do, everyone saw it and you couldn't deny it. And though it was incredible, like the, the global momentum around it. I know every process I went to, you could just feel everyone around you like fighting for the same fight. And that was so powerful and that was great, but it was only so long that momentum was realistically going to last. And I think a lot of people at the time, a lot of organizations were honestly ticking boxes to say they were doing the right thing. But what impact would that actually have down the line? And that's what we're seeing now. And with the work I do, I think, although you're seeing a lot of companies and organizations drop off on what they promised to do in 2020, it's the voices of people who are truly passionate about this work in ED&I that are coming through now. They found their voice in 2020 and they're coming through. And I think this work has to be continued to be done and to be heard and there to be a space for it. And it's not necessarily from the media, but it in all the conversations I'm having, people are still equally inspired and putting in the work and it's just continuing to do that, I think. Brilliant. Although no. it was a horrible, sorry, yeah. No, sorry, go on. You were saying you didn't want to. I was going to say, like, although it was a horrible event, I think we were very lucky at the amount of media interest that it got and brought, and that was what yeah. gave it the power. It's just got to keep continuing. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Hear you on that. Uh, we've got a couple of questions coming in actually, so this is this is good. I'll I'll sort of throw them in the mix actually as we go along rather than just do it all at the end, because it's nice to just get some audience engagement. And so um, there's 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 an aspect of that which you've answered, Darcy, in this one. So Lipper, um, there's there's an aspect for this now that is that we can sort of like move along a little bit, which is how do you think that, um, you know, you both have positive and negative experiences within within sport, which we've, we've touched on. But Lipper, if you, if you would like to sort of maybe address like how um, you think sort of um, access to sport has has changed since you've been involved with it and also um what you hope to see in the next five years I think that's from an anonymous attendee yeah. <laughs> thank you for the question um i think because of the, di the digital generation we live in it's easier to find out when events are happening where to access them however if we did not have that i think we'll still be in the same position that we were a couple of years ago before the digital era uh now talking about communities there are several I'm just going to talk about the Muslim community. So um, one of the hats I wear, I'm a trustee for the Muslim Sports Association, and we created an impact report studying Muslim women nationally. And 97% of the women of our survey said they would they would love to participate in sports and physical activity. However, 37% of those women have, haven't touched sports at school. Um, so where's that gap? How do we bridge that gap? How do we provide women with opportunities to access these sports because yes we'll get the funding but then we'll have no leisure center to do it or we'll have the leisure center to do it but no funding and if there's funding we'll only have funding for a couple of months and then it's gone so these small organizations can't do it by themselves we need more support from those in governance to bridge that gap and bridge it quick, quickly because having that will allow less strain on other health and social care services. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another one here from um, from anonymous from an anonymous attendee, and it's for Alison. Uh, so, Alison, if you're okay to answer this, or have a, and also do, guys, feel free to chip in as well if you've got points to say on any of these. Just I'm just directing them to whoever may, I may feel would be up for answering first. So feel please do feel free to jump in. Um, so Alison, when you talk about equal access to sport for boys as well as girls, you've worked in education and sport for a while and wondered what's uh, the best single piece of legislation uh, or maybe a single campaign you've seen that's had the most impact. So so over the years, you've, you've sort of been involved with this, Alison. What do you think is that one that's had the most impact and um, the most sort of like, I guess, currency, if you like, as well? And what change do you think? Actually, I'll ask you that one after. You, you go okay. do that one first, yeah. <laughs> um, gosh, these are great questions. Thank you again for that, that question, where it came from. Um, listen, I, I think one of the things that I've seen that is most powerful is probably less a campaign or a piece of policy, although I might touch on those in a minute, is um, the engagement, for, for me, because I work in youth sport, the engagement of young people in 
the creation and delivery and promotion of sport. So um, at the Youth Sport Trust, the development of leadership skills in young people and then the empowerment of young people to effectively create the sporting environment that they and their peers want and seeing us, and I say us as a former teacher, seeing us as the people who are in service of young people as those with the knowledge, skill and ability and access to resources to make that environment possible for young people instead of imposing our desires on young people or our experiences on young people. Let's embrace the, the young people's voice, their ideas. You know, they are in touch with their peer group much better. They, they have more empathy with their peer group perhaps than, than teachers do. But what hopefully teachers, we're not saying, okay, we don't need teachers anymore, just let young people do it themselves. What we're saying is teachers therefore need to have those skills to listen, to respond to that, to, to draw together the resources or the opportunities to, to, to make it possible for young people to, to, to realize those ambitions. And that's what the Girls Active program that we deliver um, funded again through the Sport England National Lottery um, is, is all about. It's about recognizing if we want to engage the least active young women uh, in sport, number one is let's engage them. Let's find out what the barriers are, what it is we need to change, what would they like to do, and then respond by creating that kind of environment. So I think that's the most single most powerful thing. And again, that's reflected in the This Girl Can campaign. But just on um, policy and um, I, I guess uh, legislation is, is in America, we do have this Title IX um, legislation, which requires education institutions to invest an equal amount in men's and women's uh, sport uh, and opportunity. And that makes sure that there is no dominance of facilities being you know, full of male sport and, and women's sport not getting a, a space in there. It, it applies to the coaching workforce. It applies to everything else around it. And I think that, um, in many cases, in university and college and high school sport in the US, we see much more equal access um, than we than we do here. But I know the Lionesses, particularly Lottie and Leah, are being very vocal about this using the platform they have of the, the Lionesses, and they indeed wrote to uh, Rishi Sunak to to ask for something similar here. So all power to their elbow, and, and let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Uh and um, the, the second part to that one, that question was, um, what simple change could be made now which would impact millions of children? Big question that, I guess, but it's a very looking forward one as well. Wow. Um, there are so many things, a, si a single bullet. Um, I mean, the, the, the most important thing is we as a society absolutely get and understand that children learn by playing and being physically active is fundamental to a young person's growth development and education it's it's there is a plethora of unequivocal evidence that says you know young people learn best when they play and when we move um our brain works better um, we, we, we develop a lot of life skills that are essential to the rest of life. So I think we need a societal shift. We need some urgent action now, post-COVID, as Lipper says, to keep our leisure centres open in a cost of living crisis. Uh, we need some decisions from the government right now, actually, about funding for school sport next year. But the bigger picture here is we've got to get that we are human beings and there are certain things ingrained in thousands of years of our evolution in our DNA that mean we have to move and we should move together. And that's what creates healthy uh, and flourishing individuals. Yeah, fair play. Good shout. Good, good answer. Um, I wanted to sort of throw a little uh, thing in here about sort of the way that sport is moving on in, in the sense that it's becoming more entertainmenty now um, and how that affects empathy. Are you going to use the, uh, the Jake Paul Tommy Fury fight at this weekend, which is which many boxing purists think is an absolute sideshow, but has engaged millions of younger younger fans and younger people, uh, men and women, um, from for various reasons. So I wanted to sort of like throw into the panel here. Uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to use the function raise hand, or you can just put your hand or whatever to go first on, on on saying like how much of a battle do you think that sport has in terms of reaching new audiences and reaching? You know, I say new audiences as in you know gender, race, you know ability. Um, and and um you know sort of newer groups such as lgbtq plus 
and trans within that as well. Um, how much of a battle do you think sport has to reach these newer people? And do you think the the more entertainment elements like the the Paul Fury fight we saw recently are on the rise? So who wants to have a go at doing that one first? And also, if you've got any questions on that newer side of things, you know, I know you guys are a lot younger than us probably, but um, if you've got like thoughts on that, then do hit us up in the queues. Uh, yeah, so who fancies going that, along those lines? How much of a battle does sport have to engage new audiences? I can go. Nice one, uh, thanks. So I think it, it there's pros and cons to everything, but this boxing match, it was the first time I saw my siblings all together watching TV and watching sports. I've never seen that in my entire life. <laughs> and that's and what, saying something. What's the gender uh, mix there? Sorry, if you don't mind me asking. So, so my little sisters hate sport, oh. can't stand it. But because Tommy Fury is an influencer's partner, yeah. not necessarily a sportsman, and Jake Paul used to do, you know, YouTube, still does it maybe. That's why they watched it. And they're reaching a different target audience than traditional boxing or traditional sport uh, would have had. But the cons of this if we go back to football is football used to be an elitist sport then became a working man's sport and now I feel like we're going back into an elitist sport um, it's becoming less accessible for parents to provide their children with an opportunity to play sports after school and I don't think that's fair um, so yes you can pump as much money as you like in the elite sport will it get ruined yes 100% um, so I think we need to uh, there needs to be some sort of cap or a new legislation put in place or policy to say, do you know what, after a certain bracket, you can't, you know, you can't expand on the fee um, or X amount needs to go into local leisure centers um, so we could better provide um, a sustainable system around um, the nation and different countries as well. Yeah. I'd Good like job. to um, just jump in on that. I think everything you said was spot on and I don't know that much about boxing, but just on what you were saying at the end there, Libra, I think sport now at the elite level is becoming, it's it's just a business. And you look at Premier League football and just the amount of money they're making is astronomical. And I think to a certain degree, when it's just a business, the people who are controlling all of it, their priorities can't necessarily be with the people. And I think there needs to be a certain amount of responsibility to redistribute some of that into the people at the grassroots level. So as Leepa said, putting in a, a cap and then using the rest of the money could be so productively used into all these incredible organisations like Alice and Youth Sport Trust. And I, I think if there were some way of controlling that, it, it could be so positive and you can see all these different people getting involved in sport, but it's I think sport can be so exclusive in terms of it's, it's just not available to everyone, especially those elite sports. Yeah. Good point. Could, could I add in as well? I mean, th thanks, Delcy. I'd love the fact that some more of the commercial uh, revenues from sport come, come into to charities and other organisations at the grassroots. Thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to make two points, I think. One is, you know, there is a point here about the world moves on and sport has to move on. Right. So uh, we've seen it, for example, in the Olympic Paralympic program, the Commonwealth Games, you know, 3x3 basketball, massive hit because it, it, it's a sport that is accessible to and is played in all of our communities, has real connection with young people. We know in Paris um, 2024, we're going to have breaking, you know, for the first time, making its debut appearance, break dancing. I mean, amazing. It, it, sport is moving on and that's great and that for me connects to the point I was making earlier about young people's voice sitting at the heart of sport and um the organizations that fund sports so UK sports sport England the other home nation sports councils did establish a code of sports governance a few years ago which now any organization in receipt of public money has to follow and um, that code was about making sure that the lived experiences of the people served by those organizations are involved in the decision making right up to board level. And I sit here today, 53 year old woman, and Lippa is my boss. Um, Lippa is one of my trustees, the charity as the chief executive, I, I'm responsible to my trustees. And that's how it should be. We are the youth sport trust and, and we should be governed by young people. 
Um, and what that will do is it will help sport evolve and evolve in a way that that kind of makes it uh, relevant to the next generation and the generation after that. But also just that point Darcy and Lipper have touched on, the the top of the sport, whether it's a celebrity boxing match or, or whether it's uh, a, an Olympic or Paralympic Games, has to be connected to the grassroots. And there are ways that this whole pyramid of participation from a huge grassroots to a very small elite uh, pinnacle, which Darcy represents here, where they're connected. But it doesn't just happen. We can't assume that Darcy playing amazing hockey is going to inspire a generation. It requires a strategic approach. And, you know, we need lots of great people trained in, in coaching hockey and volunteering to deliver hockey to turn that inspiration into action. And that does mean that the funding has to cascade down as well to, to keep, again, feeding players up through. And that sometimes just doesn't happen well enough. Yeah, yeah, I understand that. Yeah. A um, couple of more uh, quick questions on the uh, Q&A, actually. I'll do the second one first. So uh, should um, all professional athletes have to do a certain number of community service hours uh, in schools or working with charities, assuming that they are paid fairly because not all uh, professional women are paid enough? Um, so that is a good question, I think. Um, do you want to have a go at doing those guys? Maybe Darcy, do you want to start first? Yeah, I think that, that's a great question. It's something I've been working a lot on within my squad at GB Hockey. And I think we have a certain responsibility or we sh should not even want to reach out to those communities at the grassroots levels to show people whether it's our sport or any sport like how amazing it can be because we all know as elite athletes that it's completely changed and shaped our lives in the most incredible ways I don't see why anyone wouldn't want to give others that opportunity um Lipa mentioned earlier she didn't have the role model that she is today when she was growing up and I think I had the same experience within hockey where I didn't see anyone look like me and that definitely discouraged a lot of girls in my situation um from joining the sport and I don't know I think I had one coach who believed in me which is probably why I still play hockey today but if you can even positively impact one young boy or girl to get involved at a young age that can just shape their lives in ways that you can't even imagine and I think like even as a female hockey athlete who doesn't make that much money, um, going into those schools is something I love doing and you can see how much they get out of it. And I think when you've got the elite male athletes who are making millions, equally they should be doing the same thing. And yeah, it's necessary, I think. Yeah. What do you and guys think? Yeah, yeah, Darcy, I just, I, you know, it's great the work that you are doing as an advocate um, for this type of giving back in elite sport and again um the, the, the good news is is that for athletes who are funded through the national lottery do do sign an agreement and a commitment to mm -hmm. give back into their community and different sports manage that in different ways but one thing that's really interesting is the most powerful athlete role models that we work with um are the ones who share their story with the young people you know it's this is kind of historically been a tradition of elite athletes rock up in an amazing GB tracksuit. Darcy, you look, look great in your GB athlete uh, kit this morning. And they hang medals around the necks of athletes who win on a school sports day. That just reinforces a stereotype, right? That those athletes are role models for the most successful, the winners, et cetera, et cetera. But when athletes go in and they do a session on, you know, maybe how they deal with the stresses and strains of life as an athlete and how they manage anxiety and worry and injury. It's those sorts of stories that can be incredibly powerful for young people in recognising that these athletes aren't, aren't some sort of um, different being to them. They weren't born with a different gene that said they're going to be in, uh, that these, these are athletes who go through all the things that young people go through. And it's coping strategies and it's put, you know, finding the right people to have around them to uplift them and inspire them, that enable them to do what they do. And those sorts of lessons are really powerful, not just for young people to feel that sport is something that they could do, but also that sport is has got enormous value to their to their life. And I know, Darcy, I know you do that in spade loads when you work with young people. And thank you so much for all the work that you do. Sure thing. Um, right. Um, I'll, uh, I think we're getting to the very end of the chat now, which is a um, bit of a shame. It's flown by and there's lots of Q&As coming in. Um, so 
Uh, there's one about how Darcy you became a professional athlete and what your advice is to aspiring young students and young girls. But um, I think because um, it's very Darcy specific, we'll, we'll, we'll go um, we'll go to a sort of more rounded one, which is uh, one here now just come in um, about how we prepare our coaches and teachers to impart empathy to their players. So I guess it's like a wider question if you think about it. Um, you know, what is like the key thing in your own lines of work, in your own spheres, where, you know, you've seen empathy being imparted well and you'd like to see more of that being done? You know, you can apply it to any sort of like aspect of your business dealings or your your sports dealings, whatever it is, whatever it is. But where have you seen empathy used as a good example? And where would you like to see more of that? Uh, and if we could sort of maybe keep to like sort of 30 seconds per answer, if that's all right. So Lippa, do you want to go first? 30 seconds, okay, well, <laughs> pressure. Just, um, just, yeah, I'll... just say a couple of things, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so every time I go to an event, I always ask if there could be a prayer room um, facilitated for me. And like, as I've gone confident within my profession, I'm able to ask those questions. And it's because people, um, allies that believed in me and are respectful of my beliefs, that I have gained more confidence in saying, can I have prayer spaces? And I think that's a great um, sign of empathy, especially within the you know sporting world, within the professional world that, that we live in, yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Do you wanna go next, uh, Alison? Yeah, I think one of the most powerful things that I've seen um, is when different generations come together through sport, because um, it builds empathy of, kind of understanding from the older generation of what the younger generation are going through and vice versa. And particularly, um, again, youth sport leadership models where secondary age children are coaching and organising sport for primary children. A amazing empathy and, and connection there. And, and as Lippa says, not just um, within a, a particular faith or, or, or cultural setting, but across those settings, mixing in children with disabilities and those without disabilities, just mixing people up across different boundaries in sport, really powerful. Sweet. And Darcy? I think I'll go down a similar route to what I said before, but I think if every kid has someone that believes in them, um, whether that's in sport or outside of sport, it will just have a huge effect on them. And you give them the opportunity to see the, see the best in them. And you can see how that impacts them in the classroom, at home, out of school, in the sports field. And I think that's something we should just all try and do. Yeah, good stuff. So yeah, a couple of questions I couldn't get to, but um, Kate Swan about most inspiring thing that's that you've all done and you, that wants to make you keep all, all going is is a good one. But I think we are at time, sadly. Apologies about that, Kate, and everyone else who wants to ask a question. But um, yeah, Alison Lipper and Darcy, thank you very much for your for your time. Um, this has been a lovely panel. Um, how sport and empathy are intertwined and how we uh, can get the best out of each other as humans and businesses for that and and schools. Um, so yeah, I guess um, this is this is it for now. But there are plenty more things going on for Empathy Week uh, throughout this week. So uh, you can engage with them on their social media platforms, and it's empathy-week.com. Not all one word. Not Empathy Week. Empathy-week.com uh, to find out more uh, on all the events and everything else that's going on with it in the future. So thank you very much, guys. And uh, yeah, look forward to, to speaking to you and, and chatting to you more over the future. And thanks for listening as well. Thanks for joining in the seminar.